Now, still another guest of mine tonight is uh, also one of our fine actors. His uh, films are uh, Man for All Seasons and From Russia with Love and The Luck of Ginger Coffee and Young Winston is the most recent in which he plays uh, Lord Randolph Churchill. He he's been, uh, and he is, a successful author of plays and books and there's something always dangerous seeming about him. I don't know what it is. Always, in his acting and when he's out here, I always feel that the next sentence he's going to say something just awful. I mean, in, in the best sense of the word awful. Will you welcome my dear friend, Robert Shaw. I mean, I mean, I mean, I meant by that uh, something in inspiring awe. Uh, well, what happened to me, ladies and gentlemen, this evening was, for the first time, I had the great privilege of going to Mr. Dick Cavett's dressing room uh, because the lavatory in this building does not work. <laughs> and, and, and the only one that does is yours. So since we're old friends, you allow me to go to your dressing room, and there I saw scope, uh, shampoo... Oh. Listerine, toothpaste. I've never seen so many bottles of things. I mean, are they all full of alcohol or something? I mean, <laughs> it was incredible. You know, I get a lot of free samples of stuff. I, I don't, see. I don't necessarily drink at all. Well, there's about 87 bottles up there in that dressing room. I yep. never knew you were like that. I heard you put away a bottle of mouthwash. I did. I swilled like it right back and tested it. Yeah. Well, that's a terrible thing to allow a man to use your lavatoire. Yes. And then to tell him everything that's in it. I know. <laughs> Such <laughs> confidence will not be reciprocated again. Why, why do they there. say the lavatory in England? Why don't they just say the John I don't know, but they say it on American Airlines. They do not say toilet. They say lavatory. And I thought, how can that be? American Airlines use that word. Lavatory is only where one washes, though, isn't it? And so it's, well, it's, it's not on American Airlines. You do everything in there. Oh, well, all right. <laughs> Say, what is this rumor I heard about you? I don't know if we ought to get uh, into that immediately, but why not? What rumor is it, Richard? Oh, I was hoping you'd pick up on it and say I know exactly what you mean. What rumor is it? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I've forgotten now what I was talking about. <laughs> there was some kind of rumor, and I, I know if it had been anything important, it would have slipped my mind. Where did you hear it? Uh, in the gutter. <laughs> you mean on the Johnny Carson show? <laughs> First. Well, That's I'll tell you what happened. Uh, uh, I um, went on the Johnny Carson show in Los Angeles on Thursday or Friday night. Yeah. And um, he uh, is a very likable man, a no friend of mine. And he asked me how I was. And I didn't honestly think that the show was going too well. Bowton produced the picture. Uh, Columbia's lawyer begging me to deny this rumor. I don't think we should go any further. Actually, I have not got syphilis. I just happened to tell Johnny Carson that I had not recovered from the germs that they had injected me with. That's the end of the story. They say, please, oh, they say, well, look dignified. Please don't let the American people think that an English actor has come here and, and is still, you know... Well, I haven't right. got it. Honest to God, I haven't got it. How often do you have to go on television and deny these rumors that come up like this about you? More and more. Is this the first, uh, is this the first time that you haven't had it? <laughs> you must ask my wife that, but, uh... No, well, I've never had such a thing, though I do feel sorry for those who have, I must say. And you, you've done all these things. I mean, listen, I live in, in, in the west of Ireland now, so I read about you in the Herald Tribune, which is the best newspaper in England, you know, or in Europe for that matter. Yeah. And I hear what you've been advertising. And, I mean, if I've got it, maybe you have. And going up to your bathroom or your lavatory or whatever, how do I know what you've got up there? I think we should get off this subject fast. Or something. Or something. No, I, I did a show about it. That's probably what you're thinking about. I don't know that. But part of the attempt was to scotch the bathroom myth attached to the uh, disease. Yeah. But Well, I've got to scotch it for the sake of Carl Foreman and Columbia yeah. and my sisters in Lancaster and 
Philadelphia and my nine children and my wife, I think, I have not got it. Well, all right, if you don't keep <laughs> protesting too much, people will believe you. Uh, yeah, but they didn't believe me when I said it with humor. I mean, that's what's so awful about the power of television. You could go on there and you say, you know, you, you could say that, I don't know, you could say anything. They'd yeah. believe you, wouldn't they? It seems that way, but uh, not always. Let's move. Where will we move to? I know what. I want to find out something else about you, but it's not quite that personal. But before I do, I have to take a message. Do you mind? No. Okay. And now a word. I'm sorry to look right across you like this. Now a word from the STP Corporation. Talking with Robert Shaw. Do you think, having played Randolph Churchill that way, do you, do you think if there had been a, an effective cure for the, for the venereal diseases back in the last century, that uh, history would be different? I know it ruined a lot of Victorian families because they didn't dare admit it. And, and so, and yet, it changed the behavior of the husband, and he couldn't explain why. And yes, well, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I didn't smoke for seven years until I did the Churchill film, and he, uh, Lord Randolph Churchill, chain smoked. So I started again after all this while, and I haven't been able to get off it for nearly a year. So that's why I'm coughing. But um, hmm. it's a shame. Winston Churchill's father, to be serious, died of syphilis at the age of 46. And the English people never knew about that until about this year. You know, that, that was absolutely hidden from us. In fact, until I read the film script that Foreman wrote, uh, I didn't know that. Anyway, Lord Randolph Churchill uh, would be your sort of equivalent of uh, Kissinger and Connolly rolled into one. In other words, he was leader of the House of Commons and Chancellor of the Exchequer, the two most powerful posts in the land. He would have been Prime Minister. And he started to go mad because he had syphilis. And Winston Churchill, his son, um, watched his father die and go mad. And if his father had lived, he would have been Prime Minister of England, the equivalent, obviously, of the President of the United States, and probably would have remained in power until he was in his 60s, because he was a very brilliant man. Probably, I would think, cleverer than Winston, actually. But anyway, he went mad and he died at the age of 46. And Winston Churchill tried to uh, redress his father's memory, make up for his father all the days of his life and says in his first autobiography that I dreamed that my father was still alive and he had these very romantic dreams. And, but he also inherited his father's enemies, which kept him out of power because, you know, Winston Churchill did not come to power I don't know if Americans quite know this, until World War II. I mean, he didn't come to power, you know, until he was nearly 60, or uh, maybe, maybe even later, maybe 61 or 62. And if Lord Randolph Churchill had not got syphilis and died, the whole course of English history would have changed because he right. would have been just a boy following in his father's footsteps, you know? They treated it with mercury in those days. Yes, it was the most poison. incredibly... I don't understand how they did that. ...painful treat. Well, they injected it backwards, sort of, you know? Yeah, Horrible, actually. Yeah. And, of course, of course, Randolph Churchill today, well, as you know, with all the programs you've been doing, I'm speaking well. to the authority, the president of the syphilitics of the United States. But anyway, <laughs> uh, and I hope Carl Foreman appreciates this. Uh, yes. no, I'm shoving it over to you. But anyway, uh, the, well, don't the don't thing is that... Uh, Lord Randolph Churchill would have been cured and he would have been the Prime Minister of England, no doubt about it. And we'd have had no Winston Churchill. And we'd have had no Winston I Churchill. Didn't realize it. Not in that sense, anyway. By the if way, you know, Winston Churchill's brother, the elder brother, the Duke of Marlborough, it uh, seems to be true, also died of the same disease, and it would seem to be that they shared the same mistress and got it from the same lady, girl. Woman. Do we know who that was? I don't want to start rumors. It was a French gossip, woman. So they say. Yeah, so they say. Yeah. Yes, in Paris. Yeah. Uh, she is still alive, and she has sent me a present of. Uh, 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 anyway, she is. Oh, come You've on. You've just undone. Listen, you're just like everybody else. Yeah, I I'm, say these things, I'm and they believe one. them. I believe of course, you she's say. not alive. I'm talking about 1850 something. <laughs> Honest to God, I'm going to go to, I'll never be employed by Columbia again. I'm ruining them. I'm, well, yes, I'm thank you, sorry Richard. I'm so thank gullible. You. I'll try well, to... We'll both be off the air. Are you... <laughs> are you... Uh, can you sympathize with that thing that uh, takes place in the film? I mean, can you imagine 
Does your father's opinion of you, has that um, formed your life? Have you tried to live up to what your father wanted you to be and all of that? Oh, well, yeah, that's sort of uh, serious and touching. My father, uh, um, I had a very uh, sad little experience in Philadelphia. One of my sisters is married to an American who lives in Philadelphia, and another is married to a... Uh, uh, Professor Russell, who is blind, who lives in Lancaster, you know, Lancaster University, or Franklin and Marshall. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, anyway, um, I always had thought, because my father killed himself uh -huh. when I was 12. Uh, I and was an alcoholic. And I'd always thought in my mind that he was about 47 or 48, and I'm 45 now, and I had thought, oh, well, I think a lot of boys do think this. I've got three or four years to go to outlive my father, right? Uh -huh. And I'd had this image for years. You know what I'm talking about? I thought, I must live at least as long as him. And um, so I've been sort of keeping going <laughs> for those reasons, in spite of... Uh, the diseases in your dressing room and the drink you've given me in it. Anyway, to be serious, uh, he was an extraordinary man and marvellous man. He was a doctor in the Orkney Islands, which is right at the uh, top of Scotland. Those terrible islands where there's wind and sea and you get a hundred mile an hour gales. And what he used to do, he was the lighthouse doctor and he used to keep a medical bag on each island. And when you couldn't get in because the sea was so rough, my father would go out with the Lawton brothers and jump off and swim ashore. And there would be his medical bag, and then he'd deliver whatever baby he was to be delivered. Anyway, I always thought he killed himself about 46, and I'm sitting in Philadelphia. And um, my sister and her husband, Walt, have been to uh, England, and they've made home movies, and they've taken a picture of the grave, the cemetery, you know? And up on the thing, I'm watching these movies of my house in England and all our children. I have nine, and there's pictures of the children in the garden and everything. Mm -hmm. Suddenly it flashes up on the screen the picture of my father's gravestone. And it says, Dr. T.A. Shaw, so and so and so. Well, he was only 39 when he killed himself. And in other words, what I say was a terrible, macabre sort of shock to me, was I've already outlived him. You're Six, past the critical uh, time. Way past it, yes. And I thought, you know, well, you know what I'm saying. It uh -huh. was a, a weird sort of feeling. I was sort of keeping going to get that far. And I find I'm already about six or seven years older. Is uh, Was there connected with it a sense that you might not make it through some mysterious sense that that would be the year that well, you two I would felt go? Or that was that if I could order? do that. You know, but I mean, I do feel like Winston Churchill. He said in his uh, uh, book that he wished that his father would have been uh, lived a little longer because he felt they could have helped him, which all boys feel, I think, if their father dies in a war, whether it's Vietnam or it's drugs or it's drink or what the hell it is. You always feel, if you're sort of a proud son, that they're very unrealistic, and it's, I'm sure it's very romantic. But Churchill says that he uh, dreamed that Lord Randolph was alive and that, they, you know, and for years I dreamed the same thing. I would dream my father was walking with me in a beautiful place and I was holding his hand and, we, and I said, everything will be all right, Dad, you know. Well, I never got to that. No. That's why I like old men. I mean, I, I love to talk to men of his age, you know. It's almost a way of encountering him. I guess. Certainly. Yeah. 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 It is odd when dead people occur in your dreams. Uh, I've been, I was reading about that. It happens to me, I know, relatives who are dead or will occur in your dreams or people you know are dead in public life, some that I've had on this show. Yes. And we're sitting and talking, and, and yet it isn't incongruous that they're alive. No. And, and I don't know why that doesn't occur to you in the dream. Uh, no. You know no. that you're talking to someone that you know was dead, but it doesn't seem strange. I no. I have to find out what that means sometime. The Next dreams time we have a psychoanalyst so, The dreams here. are so real, aren't they? But, but, I mean, for me, they always occur in sort of beautiful and happy surroundings. It's never a sad dream. I always wake up and I think, yes, he was alive, and I walked with him last night, wherever it was, you know. Yeah. And I feel that uh, I um, helped him. Of course, I didn't. I mean, the man was dead when I was 11, however. Well, 
pardon my probing so deeply into your I don't mind at all, because it's true. Okay. We have a message. We'll be right back. My next guest is a obviously talented lady. Her star seems to keep rising. She's been on Broadway, starred on Broadway in Hair, and then she won a Tony for her performance in Pearly. And you can see her in person at the Apollo, November 15th to 21st, if you're in this area. If you're not, you can get a look at her right now. Miss Melba Moore. You're singing into a dead mic. You're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. Really? Isn't this awful? We're on the air and everything. No, that's all right. Now, they told me this, but they didn't tell me what to do about it. Would you like to... <laughs> I have a mic here. Would you like to sing into my tie? Yes, I'll, I'll sing to you. Well, why don't we come and sit down and see if how quickly we can order another one of these from Battle Creek, Michigan. <laughs> All right, come on down. What a terrible thing. What kind of a happening is this? I don't know. Oh. Happen stops. I don't know. I don't invite, a, invite a professional arti arst artiste onto the program and give them schlocky equipment to work with. Oh. <laughs> I don't know how that could have happened. Well, this will certainly test whether you're a good sport or not. Are you staying, Melba, or are you going to walk off in a huff? Oh, no. I can't huff right now. <laughs> 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 what? what, what uh, why? Why can't I have? Yeah. Uh, really, I'm just too excited about tomorrow and everything else, and I, I have to stay long enough to tell the folks about that. That's a significant event. You open at the Apollo Theater. Yeah. In Harlem. Uh huh. Hundred and twenty-fifth. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I haven't been there for years, uh, uh, but um, you've not been able to go there for years, have you? Well, there's a certain amount of fear about going there. Should there be? No, there really shouldn't be. Because so everybody went there last night, didn't they? They sure did. Yeah. 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 What was last night? Well, last there was night, this huge yeah. big thing in Harlem. I wanted to go very much, actually, because I used to go to Harlem. I mean, I'm English, obviously, so <laughs> yeah. it isn't so bad because you just say, if anybody's nasty to you, you say, I'm English, and you get away with it in a way... <laughs> But I was always very welcome in Harlem. I absolutely love Harlem. And this whole great big thing went on yeah. there last night with everybody there. Well, I don't know. Maybe it's... I didn't even know what was last night. I mean, am I telling town, you as an American the... something you don't know with absolutely. you? Absolutely. I didn't... Okay, it's out. Called... I haven't seen the papers. It was what, called, Did something uh, happen? Yes, they had a great big benefit at which so many people were there. I can't even begin to name the folks that were there. To yeah. raise money for the uh, Harlem Dance uh, Theater run by Ar Arthur Mitchell. Oh, and it was okay. called Come Back to Harlem in Ermin's Pearl or jeans or and jeans oh, yeah. mm. I was supposed me. to be there but I couldn't make it because I was rehearsing for my opening tomorrow it just things just piled up on me what's the significance of, of an opening at Harlem now do you do a different act is it a I will it's, it's significant to me I don't know about the other people who work there but I've never I didn't come up through the Apollo as yeah. most uh, black acts have or record acts have and uh you know I, I will have missed it if i don't go there you gotta go to the apollo man that's is it. there a sense though in which they uh it's, it's, you haven't arrived with a black audience until you've played the apollo? i don't know i feel that way i feel like i will have missed something if i don't get up there yeah. yeah. Now, would you be able to do songs and references and words and introductions and things that you couldn't do for a white audience because they just no. wouldn't know what you were doing? Or no, you, not at all. Is there any sense in which you play to the audience that way? Yes, there is, and that is that you better be good or they love to throw you out of there. <laughs> See, audience participation. Think, yes, yes. Through. I think one of maybe one of the basic differences uh, is between the Apollo or that kind of a circuit and say the Waldorf or the similar circuit is that um, at the posh clubs people pay a little bit more attention to the critics. Up there, they really don't care who said you was good, bad, or what. If they like you, fine, they eat you up. If they don't like you, they eat you up. <laughs> You know, well, so it. it's it's really right. a challenge and an exciting thing to to try to please an audience like that. That's why you know, I really want to. Well, when an act goes over there, it really there's nothing like it. They Did really you ever see Red Fox at the Apollo? Yeah. Unbelievable! <laughs> I've never heard any comedian get laughs he's, like Red he's Fox. Brilliant. He's brilliant. Well, when he plays the. Uh, you know, you better be up there. And I didn't know what some of the lines meant. You know, I mean, I was uh -huh. aware that there was a kind of, there were a few, uh, yeah. sort of an underground vocabulary that I wasn't sure yeah. of. There's yeah. an but. incredible example. Uh, and tell me if I'm, uh, you know, interrupting you, because, I mean, you're the star here right oh, now. Oh, no, no, no. No, but I just want to say that... Um, I like you. So he's nice. He's nice. Yeah. You like him. Uh, yeah. I, well, I told you before I liked oh, you. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, but I didn't know that. <laughs> well, anyway, this picture that I have done, the young Winston, yeah. in which I have... Now, let's just sort of be serious, right? 
<laughs> yeah, but there is a country in the world... Now, what about this, ladies and gentlemen, for an example of censorship? And you tell me, you write in and you guess the country that will not allow the film to be shown in its present form. They will not allow the word syphilis to be mentioned, right? And there is a scene in the picture where the doctors say to Anne Bancroft, have you had uh, sexual relations with your husband? And um, uh, if you have, please discontinue them. And she says, I have not for a year. And they say, thank God. Uh -huh. What country do you think that would be that have banned this film in its present uh, form and why? Boston. South Africa. I was going to say Australia. I was going to say that. I was, were you going to say it? I was why? Australia. Why? Because. Uh, because. Uh, black people are not allowed to see that Winston Churchill's father had syphilis, had syphilis, one, and that a very famous white man had syphilis, two. So it's, they say, apparently, according to the story, this is not from Columbia, I've got it on the grapevine, they say, it's, we'll allow you to show it in its present form if it's for white audiences only. Now, you think of the back, sort of, head of those political censors. Can you imagine that? Yes. In 1972. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Yeah, yeah. that is incredible. Yeah. Incredible. It is pretty weird. <sighs> I'm well, fired from Columbia, fellas. But, uh, <laughs> I may as well go down with all guns firing Come anyway. On, we'll go down and get together. We're going to try to get a giant megaphone, and in the next segment, Melba will try to sing directly through to your homes. Uh, we don't have any faith in our equipment. We'll see. Uh, I guess everyone knows that Dracula is a name that's uh, associated with the most notorious vampire in, in literature and in uh, horror film history. And uh, did you know there was a real Dracula in the 15th century in Romania? Maybe not. Well, you, the, no, you may know that the novel by Bram Stoker, which was a 19th century novel, is celebrating its 75th anniversary. And the 1931 film version starring Bela Lugosi was largely based on that uh, novel, I suppose, uh, and of a few other things. And it's been haunting the television screen for years, the movie. And now two Boston College history professors, scholars, have done a serious study about the link between Dracula's... Uh, 15th century counterpart in Romania and Bram Stoker's character uh, and they have written this book which is uh, which covers Dracula from uh, up one side and down the other it's called In Search of Dracula a true history of Dracula and vampire legends the cover is from the from the Murnau film I believe um, looks like it anyway I saw that once years ago will you welcome please Dr. Raymond McNally and Dr. Radu Florescu Which of you is, um, is which, and how do I know? He's the Irishman. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes. Dr. Florescu is the... I'm Radu Florescu, yes. the yes. Romanian. You are Romanian. And Transylvanian. You know, for years I have thought that Transylvania was a name made up for Dracula films, and uh, you can find it on the map. Yes. Most Sir? people don't realize, they think it's like Ruritania, you know, some place mm -hmm. that was made up, but it's a real place. And, and it's in the uh, Ural, not in the Ural Mountains, in the Carpathian area of... Yes. Uh, I always thought it was Hungary. Uh, well, for a thousand years it belonged to Hungary, mm -hmm. but after World War I it became part of Romania. Yeah. Transilva, you know, yeah. land across the forest. This is the way the early chroniclers describe it. Transilva. Yes. I see. Well, now, was there really a Dracula, or are you two Clifford Irvings here? Who are... <laughs> well, you know, you mentioned Bela Lugosi. It was while watching a Bela Lugosi movie about 15 years ago that I had an intuition that there must be some basis to it because yeah. Transylvania is real, the places described in the novel which are all in the film are real, so I thought there might be some basis to the actual person and put together a team of researchers and we were able to discover that the real Dracula, the actual historical Dracula, was in a way much more frightening than the Dracula, the Count Dracula of vampire movies because he was real, he was a, an impaler, he liked to 
um, stick his victims on stakes. What, and he drank blood? He really drank blood? No, he didn't drink blood. He was bloodthirsty. He was a kind of sadist, but he wasn't a specific blood drinker. He didn't drink the blood of the female victims? Or no, no. Like you see, Stoker created an artificial marriage between Dracula the Horror King mm -hmm. and Transylvanian vampire practices, which do, in fact, are still being practiced even today. And this artificial mariage de convenance, we destroyed. There is Dracula the man and Transylvanian vampirism. And we want to make this point very clear because we have been exposed a lot about this. Now, which of you should I address on which subject? One of you specialty is vampires and the other is Dracula? This is the vampire. Well, I know a little bit more about vampires. <laughs> you, are, you are a vampire. I, I know a little bit about Romanian yes. history, too. About those two little red marks on our makeup girl's neck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what is, what is the difference? What is the difference between a Hungarian and a Romanian? Language difference. No, no you've never heard that old joke. No, no, I don't. Oh, well, they say they both give you your sister or their sister. Doesn't matter which, they get the most money for. But the Hungarian will deliver. No, the Hungarian will deliver. You're working. Oh, how dare you? You've never heard that? No, oh, Hungarians so, have been very nasty about yeah. the Hungarians, you know. The Hungarians and Romanians dislike it. Well, other. today not. They used yeah. to. Because Transylvania was Hungarian for a thousand years and it became Romanian in 1918. We've had it, but the majority of the population is Romanian. Yeah. Although they're Hungarians and the descendants of the Huns and Saxons. Hun is what Hungarian comes from. Related. In some sense. Related. What, Attila it's the very, That whole the history of that whole area of the country is very mysterious. He was bitten by a vampire bat, you know, one of the sickly traditions. This is McNally's the domain, but Attila was bitten by a vampire bat. Vampire bat, but not a vampire human. But <laughs> as we go on later, uh, we will, you will establish and document the fact that there are human vampires, or have been, on the face of the earth. Will you? We will tell you about some. All right, we'll be back after this message from our Which local is cool. I get a kick out of exploring old houses and things like that. And when I read about the castle that you had gotten to, um, well, there are two castles, weren't there, really? But there's one that we can safely call Dracula's Castle. Uh, and that's the one that you had to, was a thousand feet yes. up. And um, which, of you, which of you fainted or something happened? Uh, there? Well, I did, really. Yeah. I was very frightened. You see, I had been dreaming about setting foot in that castle for many years. And the whole build-up, you know, I rushed up to the top of the... Uh, there's a mountain and there's a small pathway that goes across into the castle. This and it was just in the Romania? Yes, in yeah. Romania. Yeah. It was just the accumulation of all... Plus, it's a very eerie place. This castle occupies the entire top of this hill, and it's a sheer drop on all sides of a thousand feet. Yeah. And when you think of all the legends about it, you know, peasants had just talked to me before I went up there saying that's not a place one should go to, that the devil guards some kind of a secret treasure. So it was kind of the apprehension of the whole thing, you know, the kind of eeriness of it all. To really set foot in Castle Dracula is an amazing thought for somebody who's interested in the horror stories and stories of the imagination. Now this man, you said he was an impaler and we sort of passed over that, but uh, can you give a few statistics uh, that won't be too nauseating about what he, his activities? He, he killed well, uh, how many people? I should cover that. Yeah. Um, the Bishop of Erlau in, eight, in 1476 after he died stated he killed a hundred thousand people. This man and, who is during six years of rule. His rule was from 1456, the central rule, to 1462. Yeah. And the total population of Valachia at that time was 500,000 people. And he killed 100,000. Now, these were not all Romanians, because there are lots of yeah. Turks, Saxons, Hungarians, and others. But this gives you a rough sense of statistic. One fifth of the, that must give you one heck of a mandate um, in, the, well, in the eyes of the rest yet, of the He was a law and order. rest man. of the voters, actually. <laughs> <laughs> And what, what, what did he kill them for? Well, this is the point. I, I think I can state this very strongly. There might have been no Romania because if it were not for Dracula. This is a very ambitious word, a very ambitious uh, uh, description, mm -hmm. but Romania considers Dracula as a national hero because when he ruled, the Danube was the frontier of Christendom. Constantinople, everyone knows, fell in 1453. Dracula was prince in 1456. So he rendered a service. He has been glorified by Romania, vilified abroad. Now, is Dracula his name? It means devil, 
son of the devil rather because his father was a devil it's uh -huh. a diminutive of devil in Romanian now why he was called son of the devil that is a very difficult question which we cannot go into well so I'd go in into it just a little let's get a look at him when, uh, while you go into it in we have three a still separate the, documents that's from a painting is it yeah. he so, signed himself Dracula in yeah. three separate documents and he's known that way in the Russian chronicles and he's known that way also in the German chronicles his he looks like John Wayne in Genghis Khan <laughs> <laughs> you know, his father got the Order of the Dragon, and that's where the term Drac, Dragon, comes from, and he used... What I think is important about this man, though, is he inspired incredible stories already in the 15th century, because other people committed horrors, like Louis XI and his contemporaries, but not on the scale. Yeah. He was on the grand scale. Was he, was he well, bigger than what? Hitler, you mean? I think oh, so. Please One don't compare him with Hitler. I, I well, refuse to accept that. Was what you consider a magician? Not in any sense whatsoever. He was a, a brutal practitioner of the art of terror, and by terror he saved his country and established law and order. But in one don't case, to ask you a serious question. I mean, are you sort of sitting there? I know that you're going to make money out of this book, make a fortune, I hope. And here we are with uh, Richard, and I've been up to his bathroom and all that. But I mean, are you saying morally that the man was justified in sort of killing all these people to restore order? I can't quite figure what's at the we, back of your you know, mind, sir. Machiavelli what? wrote his prince just a few, a little later than Dracula, and he justified despotism. Yeah, but what do you? justify? I justify despot... I, I'm a historian. I look at a period in terms of its own period. He, I'm, I'm think, thinking in Romanian terms, I think he was a man needed to combat the anarchy prevailing in his land and the vindictiveness of the Turks coming from abroad. This is my... You really think that it's all right to kill 100,000 people to restore order? Well, as a, good no as a good Romanian, is that your... Uh... I'm not... I'm, <laughs> I mean, I'm no... I'm not. King. I I'm mean, putting the base. Never up. mind about being a bloody historian. I mean, <laughs> is that what you really are saying? That's okay if you restore order? Well, well you should come I'm to the north of Ireland where I live. We could do with a few Romanians there. I say, chop, chop. I mean, really. I'd like to say, you know, the, about 80% of what he did could be explained away in terms of the times. You know, the Turks were coming up from the south. Well, and, yes, and everyone and needs of, a hobby and uh, <laughs> things like that. Fed it. But there and is another... every leader has little foibles. LBJ lifted a dog by the ears and yeah. killing 100,000 people on stage. What is that? There's a macabre aspect to the man, to the real man. I mean, there are certain things that he did that were really not quite excusable in raison d'etre and all those traditional well, arguments. Well, tell the one about the big Beggars. Yeah. I believe it was. Uh, he invited all of the... Yeah, he invited the beggars and the poor to a great feast in his yeah. palace, and then he asked them, is there anything else I can do for you? And they said, well, they expected some great gift, and they said, Lord, if we could only be relieved of our daily cares. So he said, very well. So he had the doors bolted down and the windows, and he had the whole place burned, and all those inside perished. And he did that. He said, so that there would be only rich people and people in good health. This is known as taking a hard line on welfare, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, Social welfare. Well, how, how, oh. how do you... Uh, it's obvious, That's what I mean. When, 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 Richard, that these two historians have a great sense of humor, I must say, they're <laughs> propagating these Romanian murderers around the world. <laughs> I mean, I mean, how much blood, how much blood did the man actually drink? I mean, 100,000 bodies were Not one ounce. Not one ounce. He did no, not drink one. We have to keep these things separate now. Yes. Now, what, what, what did a vampire things. do then? Well, you see, it was Bram Stoker, the novelist, who connected up authentic Transylvanian folklore about vampirism with Dracula. But the real Dracula was just a sadist. Sure. See? Simple oh. sadist. Oh, what, what, uh, and the what, in the Patriot. In the Patriot. I think it's interesting that in the old Dracula novel, uh, it starts out where he, he talks about talking to my old friend, Dr. So-and-so, or something, and he names a town, and you just assume those are made-up names. And it turns out that not, the man did exist that he was talking about. His friend was yeah. a, uh, a scholar in Budapest or something. That's like right, it? a Hungarian professor. And he filled him yeah. in in the 1890s, filled in Stoker about Transylvania. And that's why so much that is in that novel is fairly authentic. So what were the steps that took you to the castle? Uh, starting with the, the fact that that town actually existed in the beginning of the novel, was that one of them? Because you see, the we, castle is not located. The actual yeah. castle is not located where Stoker located it. The castle yeah. is in southern Transylvania. Transylvania, Stoker located a mythical castle in northern Transylvania, but the rest of the Stoker well, story is... Well, it's prettier there. It's wilder there. <laughs> yeah. 
It's a wild, forlorn country, and this northern area is actually the center of Transylvanian vampire lore, much more than southern Transylvania, where the actual castle is. Although Dracula used the name Dracula in the 15th century, the name got forgotten by in Romania, and the story was never published, the, Dra the Count Dracula story. Mm -hmm. So he became known 150 years after his death as the Impaler because of this practice of his. Yeah. So it was a matter of reconnecting, as it were, really, this the original Dracula from the 15th century with this uh, Vlad the Impaler, which is what he's known as today. And that brought us right to the castle. It was the castle of Vlad the Impaler, and Vlad the Impaler is Dracula. Is there a jinx about going to the castle, uh, supposedly? Uh, well, well his uncle fell luck. down, um, yeah, broke his hip. Listen, if a, Romanian, if a Romanian and an Irishman go together anywhere, you know they're going to be all right, I'll tell you that. <laughs> these, so. these two well, fellows are gun runners for the IRA, <laughs> haven't you got the hoax? <laughs> the whole thing is a hoax, an absolute political hoax. You mean there's no such place? No such there's place. No such place, place these two yeah, fellows are raising exist. money in New York for Northern Ireland. That's what they're doing. <laughs> well, you know, you're right in the way that... Yeah, well. It's that combination of Bram Stoker, who was an Irishman, and yeah. Arminius von Bury from Hungary that produced that novel, Dracula. It's a, it's a partnership. It worked yeah. a bit of a pain of, in the neck, you know. It was not an easy <laughs> partnership and a sort of uneasy cocktail, you know. Celtic, we're all basically Celtic. An easy I what? I can see that. Cocktail, I call it. A, bit, a, a mix, in other words. <laughs> He's kind of come back. <laughs> Let it be. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh... Hmm. I will. <laughs> what, what, but you broke your hip or something going to the castle? I didn't know. My uncle, who uncle? should have known better, yeah. tried to climb this rather abrupt precipice and fell some 50 <coughs> feet into a ditch and broke his hip and has been lingering in various Romanian hospitals almost ever since, though he has recovered now. Well, is the castle open to tourists? Is it furnished? What does it look like inside? It is, is it spider web? green. It is unfurnished. And it is going. To, we are going to have a Dracula tour together with General Tours and Pan Am. And the castle will uh -huh. be visited from a distance with sans et lumière, with light and shade, but we do not encourage the tourists to go up because not of its spiritual dangers, but because of its uh, actual physical hardship. You have to be an alpinist. But Nally yeah. experienced this and fell on his face as he entered it. He was exhausted and spiritually exhausted and also physically exhausted. I well, say. I didn't fall flat on my face. I want to correct that. I did. You fell I flat fell. on something. Yeah. <laughs> well, right. well, you fellows aren't connected with Disneyland or anything, are you? No. <laughs> you know, this interest in the occult, though, is very strong among college students. We've just been on tour with American Program Bureau and going to various campuses, yeah. and there's fantastic interest in this sort of thing. They're having whole weeks devoted to, well, sure. questions of the occult, generally, and Dracula fits into that because most but, people think but of but him let as Let me an correct occult. you here, because there is the occult interest, but I'm also giving a whole course at Boston College on Dracula, the historical man. So there's both interest. Dracula, the man, is interesting. The occult is interesting. But I'm persisting in divorcing the two from each other. Well, I think, though, I, I disagree with that one, because I think people come to Dracula through the mythical Dracula. You know, that's the one they know, Bela Lugosi and all that. And then they can, through that, get involved in the historical. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had two such persuasive men in my life. <laughs> They're going to make a fortune. You do realize it. You've <laughs> launched a huge campaign. Of course. Yeah, but, you know, but just because they're selling Dracula tattoos. No, he is going to be drinking the Boston College blood. <laughs> and, and he's going to be, you know, whatever you were analyzing. We, we have a message for our local stations. We'll be right back. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks to doctors McNally and Florescu, authors of uh, In Search of Dracula. Don't let the tourists muck up the castle. Let, let it be, you know, like it is. And uh, Melba Moore, Robert Shaw, nice to see you in such good health. And uh, <laughs> tomorrow night, Rod McEwen, actress Lotta Lenya, and uh, widow of Court Weill, the original star of the Three Penny Opera way back there in Berlin. Guys, thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can learn about Jaws, Sharks, movie making and everything in between. Also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok and Instagram and be sure to check out our website, thedailyjaws.com. Until next time, we drink to your legs, farewell and adieu.